welcome everybody and thanks so much for joining us for the fourth uh, publication of the fourth annual uh, Healthy Street Scorecard, London Borough's Healthy Street Scorecard. Uh, just a note that we are recording this, so if you don't want to be recorded, please uh, turn, turn, turn your video off or turn off. Um, and please keep your microphones off uh, at, at all times. And um, it will probably help if, uh, if videos are off as well, except for speakers, just for bandwidth. Um, yeah, so I'm going to do a quick introduction, then we're going to do the main presentation, and then we're going to hear from um, some speakers. I'll come to that in a moment. I'm, uh, I'm going to chair the event. I'm Alice Roberts. I'm from the Campaign to Protect Rural England, the London branch. Um, there are lots of, uh, lots of reasons why CPRE London is interested in transport um, and we came together some uh, four years ago in 2018 with, um, with a number of other groups in, uh, to reflect the fact that there are a very large number of issues that, uh, that come from the, dominant, do, the car dominant, um, the dominance of cars in our city, um, which we're all kind of trying to resolve and those are the, those are those cut across very many issues and so we wanted to show a united front in trying to um, promote some of the uh, ways that we think will tackle those issues and I think it's worth going over them very quickly so um, here I go so one of them is road deaths and serious injuries as air pollution it slows buses down puts people off walking, puts people off cycling and wheeling, it creates noise pollution, it's high carbon, stops people wanting to visit or linger in high streets and town centres, detracts from historic settings and visitor attractions, reduces independence for kids and teenagers, increases isolation for older people, severs communities where roads dominate, stops kids being able to play out, takes up huge amounts of valuable space, which is increasingly needed for parks, rain gardens, and walking and cycling infrastructure. It leads to urban sprawl and loss of countryside because the space is used so inefficiently within the city and deep breath, it is expensive. So I think it's worth just taking stock of those things and using that to explain why we feel that, uh, that having a coalition is so important. Um, but we also came together in 2018 around the time of the publication of the mayor's transport strategy and the critical target within it, which was mode shift. So to move from approximately 40% of journeys being made by car to around 20%. Um, and we recognised that because 95% of roads are managed by boroughs, that the boroughs, the London boroughs, would have a massive role to play in, um, in ensuring that that target was met. And so, <clears throat> so we came together for that for that reason around that target. And what we decided we wanted to do was to publish data which would help to ensure that everybody had the, the, the information that they needed to really uh, move, move things forward. Um, and since then, we, we've really achieved quite a lot in terms of getting some, some, imp, some data and information out there, which is really hope, you know, pushing, pushing um, the, the boundaries of what, what's, uh, what we're able to do. Um, one particular issue that, um, that nobody really had understood before was the extent of controlled parking in each borough. Um, likewise, nobody had really understood the extent of low traffic neighbourhoods across um, different boroughs. Um, but also one, one figure that is quoted a lot now is the car ownership rates across boroughs and particularly the proportion of households that don't own a car. And that's a figure that is used much more consistently now. So, so it is a coalition effort. Um, particular thanks this year go to um, Sustrans and Giulio Farini, who in particular, who have created a map of buses, which Ollie is going to come on to in a moment. Um, so Ollie Moore from Sustrans is going to present the results this year in just one moment. And then we're going to be hearing from speakers from across the parties. Um, we did ask, I should stress that we did ask for a speaker from a uh, Conservative councillor to join us, but were unable to find one. So yeah, so I think that's all from me and so we can just get started straight away. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ollie to present the results and you will have a chance to, as Ollie's getting his screen together, uh, to ask questions, but I would ask that you put questions into the chat and then Emma Griffin, who is here, part of a coalition from London Living Streets, will ask those questions um, for you. So yeah, please do ask questions in the chat. Any that we can't get to, 
we will um, we will get back to you after the event. So yes, without further ado, Polly. Hi, uh, welcome everyone to the results section uh, of this year's scorecard. If I just share my screen, we'll we'll get straight into this. Um, Alice has given quite a a good list there, quite a, quite a long list of some of the challenges and issues that brought up by the car dominance of our streets. And so uh, we want to we want to look at uh, how boroughs are handling this. I think Alice has made some of these points. There's the list of the the coalition there that we've put together. Um, here's some of the specific aims of the mayor's transport strategy that was the precursor to this coalition in terms of sustainable mode share, people getting the recommended daily active travel recommendations uh, and the vi vision zero. Um, and I think what we wanted to focus on with this coalition was really the role of boroughs as being um, those with the control over 95% or so of the borough of London's road capacity. So what can the boroughs do? So it's an annual scorecard, as Alice mentioned, the fourth year we've put this together. Um, uh, and it's kind of grown each year and got better each year and we've got more data each year. So there's some new things to present here. Um, so what I'll just run through is uh, the overall scores for this year, um, focus on a couple of the big changes that we've seen uh, and then go through uh, some of the more detailed results. Um, now we we break down the scores into two kind of categories really input indicators uh, and outcome indicators um, i'm not going to read all these out but the, the inputs are really those actions that boroughs can take um such as a 20 mile an hour limit across the borough um and then this little chart just shows those are the things that boroughs we have identified can do to have the impact to create those outcomes now is it, when you talk to Londoners, everyone seems to agree about the outcomes. Everyone thinks it's a good thing to have fewer collisions on our roads. Um, where the discussion comes in is really those inputs. Um, and these are the ones that we've come up with. So I'll just I'll just go through the, the overall score here for the for the year. And um, this is our kind of uh, league table, if you like. Um, and what we see might be quite familiar. We see some of those leading boroughs always seems to be Hackney and Islington are kind of the top uh, performers there. Um, you see Waltham Forest there as an outer London borough, but also Richmond and Merton kind of climbing up there as well. Um, what we often see here is people point out that the light blue, by the way, is the inner London boroughs and the dark blue are the, the outer London boroughs. And this is a score out of 10 that, that we give. Um, and people notice that, oh, it looked the inner London boroughs uh, doing better um, and so what we've done this year and I'm not going to um, go try and get into all the details of all the figures here because they're available online we encourage everyone to look on the website for these and we don't have time to go through all the detail but we do notice that the inner London um, performed better and we've tried to address that this year um, by adjusting the scores for density so I think this is quite a significant move in the right direction um, so what we've done is we've made a calculation of what boroughs should be performing um, based on the density of that borough, the housing density, because housing with housing density comes that demand for the local services, the local shops, um, which really helps with creating that kind of walkable neighborhood environment for people. So there is the density does bring the advantages. It's also highly correlated to public transport accessibility. Um, so this is kind of a catch-all for that as well. And what you what you see is quite quite a different uh, set of results, really. Um, here, what we're saying, if you look at Waltham Forest at the top, for example, is that compared to what you would expect Waltham Forest to achieve, it's about one or two points above that. So it's scoring well there. And you, you see that it's not all about the the uh, the inner London boroughs up there anymore. So you know, look at the top five, you've got Wolf and Forest, Richmond there, Merton performing well. So some really interesting results. And then if you look at the lower end of the table, um, you've got somewhere like Tower Hamlets, which ba based on its density should be doing much better than it than the results show it is currently performing. Um, 
I realise when I'm talking that it's so I'm so focused on the numbers uh, and these are real lives, these are real streets and these are real activities in people's boroughs. But I think just for this one day in the year, we just have to we just have to talk about numbers a little bit. Um, so, you know, other boroughs down there, Barking, Dagenham, Redbridge, Hillingdon, uh, you'll be looking for more action there. So we just wanted to highlight uh, a couple of the big changes for this year, um, which are the decline in car ownership in some of the boroughs that are performing well across the board um, and the continued growth in school streets that we've seen in the last year. Um, so this is uh, just a, the chart on the change in car ownership that we saw up to December last year. Um, and you can see really the, the quite, some quite significant falls in some boroughs, places like Newham, Southwark, Camden, Waltham Forest. And, and when you look at the table, you do notice that it is the boroughs that have taken more action on some of the healthy streets agenda um, that have performed better in terms of reducing car ownership. Um, if you add up all the car parking spaces of all those cars, it looks like we've freed up about 64 football pitches uh, in London. So then we're talking about optimistic uh, things we can do with that space. Um, yeah, so, we, we're encouraged by the falling car ownership. Of course, the ULES was introduced um, in October last year, so that would have played a part, but it's always a number of factors, isn't it, to decide whether people decide uh, to own a car or not. So it all, it all plays its part. Um, another area of encouragement, I think, uh, over the last year is the growth in school streets. And um, what we'd see is, this chart is showing just the growth from 2021 to 2022. And we do see that continued growth in places like Hackney and Islington. But what is also encouraging is seeing the increases in places like Lewisham, Harringay, Ealing. It's a, it's a big list. Barking Dagenham, Kingston, Redbridge and Hillingdon. Um, potentially places that aren't so associated with big actions on this agenda. But in terms of school streets, seems to be something that um, boroughs can take a lot of action on across London, what, what, whatever their views are on other, on other actions. So we're encouraged by the school streets. Now I'm going to go through the, in, the input indicators, those actions boroughs can take, um, and I'm not going to spend so much time on the outcome indicators at the end, I'll explain that. So this is exciting because this is a new indicator. Uh, it doesn't actually contribute to the overall score, that mark out of 10 that we give to boroughs. It doesn't do that yet because we want to do a bit more liaising, set, sending this to, to councils and talking to them about it in a bit more detail. And we hope to add that next year. Um, but we have done, we put the, the data together. Um, we put this map together, as Alice mentioned, of the yellow is bus all the bus routes in London all those roads the bus goes down um orange is the bus lanes uh, where 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 there's the bus priority through a bus lane um and then the blue is where there have been low traffic neighborhoods either na naturally occurring in some cases that don't uh, aren't useful through routes for through traffic or in some cases retrofitted and and created by councils and where the bus runs through those areas that is a form of bus priority as well. And it can be quite significant in some boroughs actually. Um, so we've, we've mapped where the buses uh, go through those neighborhoods and they get a score for that as well. And they, so the overall score for the bus routes is the proportion of bus routes, which are bus, which do have pr bus priority. And this map will be publishing as well. Uh, and then here you can see the results of that analysis. Um, so the, the top three boroughs, Hackney, Islington and Lambeth, have really significant proportions of their bus routes prioritised. Then you've got some more of the middle boroughs, uh, around 30%, 20% in some places is a bit low for in, some inner London boroughs. And then you really notice Kens Kensington and Chelsea um, with just 5% of its buses uh, using bus priority routes. Um, so they're, they're quite low down on the list there for inner London. We've, here's, here's the score just for outer London. So some of the outer London boroughs performing better, places like Ealing, Barking, Dagenham, 
a Merton, uh, and then the lower end of the table seems to be B's, uh, Boroughs beginning with B, you know, Bexley, Bromley and Barnet, places like that. Barnet might be an interesting one uh, with a change of administration. Is there going to be a, a change of focus on um, sustainable travel there? So uh, the bus, the bus is indicator is a new one and is definitely worth having a good look at and is really interesting to see. And we want to see how boroughs progress in the future. So low traffic neighbourhoods uh, is another one of our in input indicators. Um, there's been less uh, progress on this in the last year. I think a lot of them went in the year before. So there's a lot of embedding those that have been going on. Um, so Hackney has got now 70% of the of the borough. The, the way TfL looks at it is now um, uh, low traffic neighbourhood. Contrast that to places like Bexley and quite a few others that have got still very small amounts. Um, and there's just an image there of Stoke Newington, Church Street, uh, even gone in the last year. Hackney is still making progress there, which is positive to see. Um, Here's the, the change over the last couple of years. Um, so, you know, we've made made positive progress, but I still think you, you look at that left-hand side of that chart, you don't have to look at every borough to see that there's still some very uh, low scoring, if you like, low scoring boroughs, not making much progress and still at a low score. So uh, we it'll be interesting to see and we're hopeful for what might happen next year. Another one of those actions boroughs can take to promote um, the solutions to all of those issues that Alice identified at the beginning uh, is the protected cycle track. Um, Wolfram Forest uh, is the leading borough for that now with 13% of its um, road network uh, providing that pr protected cycle track. Um, Kensington and Chelsea, the lowest performer. I think someone has found a little bit of protected cycle track somewhere. Um, and so you'll see on the next, cha the next chart, it's not quite 0%, but it's, it's just about there. Um, what's interesting about this chart, I think, this is the, the, the overall scores now, is the, the top three boroughs there uh, are all outer London. So it's not necessarily kind of inner London, outer London thing, this one. Um, the City of London, it's got so few residents, such a small area, the results can be skewed. So I might not talk that much about the City of London. Um, 20 mile an hour limits, um, one of the key key asks of the of the coalition. Um, and some boroughs there, uh, Westminster, Kensington and Chelsea, credit to them, 100% uh, of the roads now. Um, whilst at the other end, places like Bar Barnet and Bromley, uh, very low scoring. So still plenty of work to do i saw um i saw a mayoral hustings the other day it was from 2012 and the the green candidate for the mayor of london jenny jones at the time said what she wants to see is within two years um 10 london boroughs have 20 mile an hour speed limits default um so here we are 10 min 10 years later well we've got a couple and there's a fair few that are on kind of 95 percent but there's <laughs> we've still got that work to do on these and we we want you know we should just get this done really control parking zones as, as alice mentioned you know this is fundamental this is the kind of it, thing that makes all those other measures you want to do much easier if you're trying to reduce that demand for parking um so there's a fair number of boroughs with 100 percent now control parking zones but there are there are still so many um even around stations and things where there's a very small amount so there's um uh, Bromley is highlighted there uh, and we also want to point out that we we don't we want small area control parking zones so people can't just easily drive from one end of a borough to another so school provision the indicator is broken down into school streets and what is called the stars uh, program um school streets uh, have shown that growth as we mentioned Something like Islington now, 49% of schools on a school street, um, but still some boroughs still with that zero, no school streets. Um, but we have seen that some growth and 
unfortunately, we have seen also some removed in the last uh, in the last year as well. Um, so this the, these are the the proportions of of uh, schools which are on um, school streets here. Um, we mentioned Hackney and Islington being strong performing. We've mentioned uh, those boroughs where it's grown quite significantly. Um, the other part of the schools indicator is uh, an acronym that I've, not many people know what it means, <laughs> but STARS means sustainable travel, active, responsible and safe. And this is really a measure of schools and local authorities and, and are they doing the basics in those schools um, in terms of just education and then the three things we can see here do they have cycles are they putting in cycle storage for for young people and for staff are they supporting with bike maintenance are they doing cycle training so a lot of the basic stuff um, which is really important to complement all of these other more infrastructure measures that we talked about um, so here's how the boroughs are doing um, the, you know the top three are all out of London actually here but what we would say is where you have got all of the infrastructure measures like there in Waltham Forest the STARS program is going to be so much more effective than where you're talking to kids about wild streets once you get out of the school it's going to be less effective so it's really complementary to that infrastructure I'm just going to run for I think one outcome indicator that we wanted to really focus on because it's another one that's um, new to this year and it forms part of the kind of car ownership and cars measure that um, we want boroughs to focus on. Um, so this chart shows the proportion of vehicle registered vehicles in each borough which is diesel that's the um, you know the line at the, the bars at the bottom that you can see um, and then Diesel being the most polluting means the right hand side are the best performing boroughs. So Camden, Islington, Southwark, and the left have the most diesel vehicles. Um, so you can see that. But what's also interesting, because we've got the electric vehicles, the, the green on the top there, um, also means you can see somewhere like Camden looks like it's got low diesel and doing quite well on electric vehicles as well. So um, that's a strong performance for this new indicator. Uh, and we hope that this will focus attention on what councils can do um, to start that phase out of diesel cars. So we, these are the, the, out, the other outcome indicators, which we haven't updated this year because some of the, some of the data isn't available yet. Um, some of it's skewed by some of the lockdown measures. So this is still using the 2021 data. So I'm not gonna run through it all. And as I mentioned, you know, look on the website, but there are these um, indicators on road danger, sustainable mode share, active travel rates, which all feed into that overall score. Um, I mean, I know Alice has mentioned it, but let's just focus again. We haven't put the numbers up here, but the road danger is we're not doing well enough. We need to improve that. Um, and then active travel rates still under under half of adults getting just 20 minutes active travel a day. We've got so much work to do, um, but you know we are moving in the right direction. I think uh, I think I've talked through all the results there, um, and back to you, Alice. Thanks so much, Ollie. That's fantastic, and we're just at 25 past. So, yeah, if anybody has feedback on the bus lanes, then please let us know. You can just click on the map, and the contact will be there. Um, I think it's just to add, I think it's about 19 bars that now have a default 20 mile per hour speed limit. I think that's correct. Um, with control parking zones, we had to roll over the data this year, but we are going to map control parking zones next year. So we'll have a big map of London for that. Um, and so, yeah, we'll probably have updated schools for that next year. That, <clears throat> that wasn't updated this year. Um, I just noticed somebody posted that Sutton has 10 school streets. So Kylie, perhaps you can get in touch with them um, and I noticed some comments about infrastructure, green infrastructure and parklets and, and about whether we can include that. We'll come on to that maybe as a question um, in a moment. Um, and, the, and some familiar things that can, um, for example, enforcement around 20 mile per hour zones. But 
Um, so thanks for all the comments and the questions, and we'll come to them. But uh, but before that, we're going to go straight to Sean. So Sean Barry is Camden councillor and London Assembly member for the Green Party, and um, and is going to. So we've asked councillors to join us to uh, reflect on this year's scores, but to also kind of talk about some of the challenges um, that councils face as uh, as we try to uh, promote this agenda. Thanks, Sean. Thank you very much, um, Alice. That was really, really interesting. And you've given me the results for a couple of days now. So I've been able to dig into them. And genuinely, I'm going to try to talk for five minutes and put my time on now. Um, but I could talk about this all day. This is really, really interesting. Um, I just want to say I really, really applaud the approach you're taking. It's, it's evidence based. It's striving to find the best, most illustrative evidence that really sort of relates to and reflects the experience that people feel on the ground of, of healthy streets. Um, and I really love the new indicator that compares housing density. So the sort of natural advantages boroughs might have with the, um, the actual results that they get on the ground and the effort that they make. And I think it, it genuinely shows that, that any borough can manage this and, and boroughs that have got natural advantages that aren't making an effort, I think are, are shown up by this. I think you can see from that indicator, Camden, Camden does well, which is good, that's my borough. Um, but also it really shows up Kensington and Chelsea and Tower Hamlets, um, that new indicator. It's really interesting to see. Um, I. I'm a London Assembly member and a Camden councillor, and I've been asked to focus a little bit more on Camden Council in this. So I'm going to, I'm going to look through Camden's results. But just to sort of illustrate why this matters, um, I've been out in Hackney recently. There was a by-election. Um, I've been around uh, De Beauvoir Ward. And I have to say, it's lovely around there. It's, I mean, you can, you can genuinely feel the difference. Um, I'm walking around that area and there's just people on bikes everywhere. Um, people are walking. The streets are quiet. You're having doorstep conversations and you're not being interrupted. And then even when I'm coming back down, I'm catching the bus on Kingsley. Road, the A10, down towards Spitalfields. Even that road is is more human. I, I found myself opposite the bus stop, and there was no crossing. And I was like, "Oh no, and that's a terrible situation to be in." But I was able to cross that road without a crossing because it was also um, nice. And so I think that you know the fact that LTNs also um, help to calm traffic on on main roads is really shown, and it, and it massively contrasts with parts of Camden. I'm afraid. I mean, certainly the area where I live. Um, I live in Tufnell Park, which is on the border of Camden and Islington, and there you've got five different roads, some, most of which are terrible to be on and you can't cross them and the junction itself is awful. But it's notable that the nicest of the five roads is Tufnell Park Road, which is surrounded by Islington's low traffic neighbourhoods. So the advantages to everybody of doing this, I think, are, are really shown. And, and I was out Mile Town Hall is, is at Mornington Crescent currently, and I was walking down Camden High Street and it's just basically hell on earth in comparison to, to, to that bit of Hackney I was in. Um, and I think, you know, there it's also, it's not just weight of traffic or the speed of the traffic, it's the number of lanes that there are. You know, they're all, there's, there's the same amount of traffic just roaring down multiple lanes, making it really, really harsh as a road to be on. The experience is not good for well-being. Um, so Camden does all right on all of this, but we only lead on the percentage of polluting diesel cars, which is really interesting, actually. And the others we sit elsewhere in the um, boundary. And I think, you know, we have had a, a good diesel surcharge in Camden for a very long time, but notably we haven't implemented something we consulted upon and wanted to do, which was increase that premium from 20% to 50% of the regular charge. If we did that, we could do even better on this um, measure. And again, we're, we're very good on, on controlled parking zones, but we're not that good on low traffic neighbourhoods yet. We've made some progress this year, and I'm really looking forward to one coming in in my ward. Um, and, and, that's, and that's interesting, I think, because my ward, again, it's on the border of Islington. The most sensible low traffic neighbourhood we could introduce includes Islington. And I think we, we do need to be looking at these cross border issues as well as just the borough by borough data. I don't know how you're going to do that, Alice. I'll just chuck you that challenge of looking at things across boroughs. Um, so, so, yeah, we've made progress in Camden, particularly on school streets, um, particularly on protected bike lanes. But I do think we can do more across the piece. And, and I think traffic reduction is key. Um, and one thing I like to talk about is 
is having a holistic policy that looks at traffic reduction across the piece. And the way I talk about it is with space, with services and with prices. And obviously space is where you, you know, you, you take away the car lanes, you take away the space from cars, you, you make sure that the priority is given in terms of space to um, sustainable modes. And then you've got to give people alternative services for longer journeys um, on public transport. And then you've got to get the prices right. And that's why um, I think that we need to be cutting fares. It's why I think we need to be um, putting in smarter, fairer road charging. And obviously, these are things that have to be done at a London wide level that can't necessarily be done by the boroughs, but would make an absolutely huge difference. So to just finish off um, with my five minutes, I'm nearly I'm just over time. Um, there's one thing I wanted to say, which is um, we are consulting at a London level now on having a London-wide ultra low emission zone. Now, this isn't the smart road charging scheme that I'd like to see, but it is something that would have a significant impact on traffic levels and enable more of this kind of thing to do with spaces, prices um, to, to be brought in. Um, and the consultation's open and it closes um, at the end of July. But from the early indications are that the people who are mainly responding to that consultation are people who drive. Um, and that isn't right, in my view. This is a scheme that would impact everybody. It would impact healthy streets. And I, and I just wanted to put in a final, with my couple of minutes, my final minute left, for more people who are going to be helped by the ultra low emission zone, by the reduction in traffic, by the reduction in pollution, particularly in outer boroughs, to respond to that as well, not just leave it to the people who are going to be paying the charge, because it's something that will benefit all of us. Thank you so much, Sean. And yes, so we would certainly um, hope that everybody's plugging responses to that consultation. So we're going to move on to Alex Zaman now, who is a councillor in Richmond. And I'm very delighted, Alex, that you could join us today. And thanks very much for taking the time. And I know you have to go at 11 today. So, um, so yeah. Go, go for it. Thanks very much. So I'll also keep my remarks as brief as possible. But um, I mean, I think what's very interesting, and I commend the work that's been done here, I think what's very interesting about what we're seeing from the results as they evolve, uh, certainly from the prism of Richmond, is that, you know, some of this stuff is relatively straightforward to implement and can push you quite a great deal higher up up the rankings here in fact i think you know some of those boroughs that perhaps have found themselves historically and even today in in the sort of bottom quartiles of some of these judgments i'd say as a borough that in 2018 19 when i was looking at this report found ourselves in broadly that place the sort of last quartile um with the measures that we've implemented in richmond we've seen ourselves move move up a great deal um, so, you know, work can be done and, and actually yield is, is, is great when, when you've frankly um, neglected areas for such a long period of time. And, you know, Richmond's story, as an example of that, without being hubristic, is, as I say, one, one of a sort of laggard set of boroughs, I think, in 1819. Um, and, and now, you know, is certainly up there in the upper corner of the outer London boroughs. Uh, and I was very interested in the weighting that you've done, obviously, also uh, uh, shows Richmond uh, in good light. A good part, I think, of, of our journey was obviously grasping the nettle around uh, reduced speeds in our borough. Um, you know, it, it's been cited that low traffic neighbourhoods are not something that we, we've been as strong on. Other boroughs have, have gone harder on that particular element. I think there's a judgment call to be made, though, borough by borough, about what what your residents will uh, support, how you can deliver measures in a sustainable way. I think one of the conscious things I've had, and without getting over politic about it, I think one of the issues is that, you know, if you run too fast on some of this stuff, the real risk is that you end up with political change, uh, you end up with resistance, and you end up with those policies that you've implemented actually being the kind of fulcrum point policies that can result in them being unwound. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sort of arguing for soft peddling here, but I do think that, you know, each, each set of elected representatives within their communities will have judgment calls about what they think can work with the grain of public opinion, sometimes lead uh, that public opinion, but do it in a way that means that those measures stick and the stickiness of those measures is important. As we've seen with some of the boroughs around LTN, some boroughs without being naming them, you know, went, went great guns on them, but of course uh, uh, pulled back very heavily too. 
Uh, I think our approach has been to try and make sure that that which we put in can stay um, because I feel that can be built on. The only other thing I was just going to say a brief bit about is that, you know, with, with indicators like this, really helpful though they are in kind of driving behavior change on the part of boroughs so they can see how they look and, and others can hold us to account for how we're doing, is that, you know, constantly refining these measures is important. I'm pleased that you're doing that because what gets counted does in many cases get done. And I, th I think of an example like school streets, where again, we've, you know, we've, we've, we've been out there with a great deal of school street deployment, but school streets are not all equal. One of the things I would observe is, you know, a number of schemes around London, including some in our own borough, are signage only. They don't really have effective measures for traffic management. And so actually, you know, there is a risk here that the numbers game presents one picture, but the actual quality of those schemes will vary immensely. And that's why I guess one of the things I'd say is that if the indicators can in some way kind of be made to reflect that, that would help. But also, I think I'd also just say, boroughs like my own and the work that we're doing obviously off the back of the local elections are now focused on not just getting more numbers so that we we look good to the outside world but also recognizing that improving the quality uh, the, the street treatments the visibility the compliance levels around those schemes is also materially important uh, i wouldn't want boroughs to be put off doing that important work because perhaps it isn't so so obviously rewarded uh, in schemes like this the only other thing I'd say on, on the waiting point that was made in the initial presentation, I think that's an important point. And I hope that it goes some way to reflecting, of course, what outer London boroughs will in many cases emphasize is that we simply don't have the same levels of alternative public transport infrastructure that can support transition. That's not made as an excuse, it's just a, a bored reality. Some of the PTEL ratings within my own borough are, are, are less than good. And so I think, you know, in, in recognizing that we're not all, to use an expression during COVID, we're not all in the same boat. We are in the same storm, but we're riding in quite different boats is important. Um, the, the indicators here, I think, help us to narrate the stories about the political will devoted to things and the choices made. And that's an important part of transparency. I would really just end by saying it is it is possible for every borough to make further inroads and progress in their own way so um please do do it richmond have done it i'm sure others can thanks thanks so much alex and i think some reflections are around the, the difference between boroughs which is you know constantly i'm constantly reminded of um and uh, as you say the indicators the input indicators that we have and making sure that those don't push people into doing things which are uh, things that we don't want um, and we're really acutely aware of that um, um, and and we do kind of run a bit of a fine line and the comments about controlled parking zones for instance is one of those so where we give it Islington uh, Tower Hamlets in Kensington and Chelsea a score of 100% um, actually we've had quite a lot of complaints about that um, because they have uh, one big borough wide scheme and, and that encourages roaming and short trips which I've noticed a few people have mentioned in the chat and so, yeah, we, we are considering whether we change that or somehow review that or mark them down on that score over time. So, yeah, so um, so our third speaker, Phil Glanville, who is um, chair of the London Council's Transport and Environment Committee, but also Mayor of Hackney, um, is here to join us. So thank you so much for joining us again this year, Phil. And, um, and yeah, we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, thanks, Alice, and thank you for having me again. Um, this, for me, is a really important annual moment. It feels like we're all waiting for GCSE or A-level results day, and we ne don't know who's up and who's down. But in all seriousness, to really pick up what Alexander said, if we don't measure it, if it doesn't get counted, it won't get done. And that healthy competition between uh, London boroughs, between the campaign organisations in London, I think has been a real part of how we've lifted the aspirations of London boroughs and the collaborative impact that we can have on creating healthier streets. And we're never static. And I think that's what's really powerful about the presentation that Ollie uh, gave is, you know, you're constantly iterating the, the work around buses and car ownership. And um, I think all really add to the, the background. I should have done a better job of introducing myself. I know you did, Alice, but I'm obviously chair of London Council's Transport and Environment Committee. That's a cross-party group. Uh, Alexander's on it. Um, uh, you've got leaders, deputy leaders, uh, transport leads from across London, uh, inner and outer, 
and we're, I hope, powerful advocates on a cross-party basis for all of this work uh, to government, uh, to the, the GLA and TFL, but also working in collaboration on those agendas. I'm probably going to predominantly talk about some of those pan-London things, but I will come back to what we've been doing in Hackney and some reflections on um, what I've seen. It's a very much a dual hat if speech. I really did agree with everything you said, though, on opening, uh, Alice, about space and mode shift. And, and both are really crucially important to why this agenda, I think, means so much to, to me and the London boroughs. Uh, I really enjoyed Sean's compliments. Um, I hope you continue to enjoy uh, Hackney's uh, Living Streets. But you also made a really powerful strategic point about the ULES uh, uh, expansion consultation and smart user charging. There's no consensus at London Council's. Uh, uh, around those two issues, but I know from a Hackney perspective, uh, things we've been pushing for for a long time and really welcomed the uh, ULES expansion uh, last year. Um, I, I did uh, highlight as well the buses work, and I'll come back to why I think buses are a crucial part of this agenda later and just release the, this analysis. Um, there are so many areas of public life, like the levelling up agenda, where competition is bad. It pits communities uh, and areas against each other for funding, uh, and it can lead to um, really perverse outcomes. But I think the competition with a healthy street support uh, scorecard is actually the opposite of that, as I said, on opening. And I think it also shows that there is nuance in there. Um, that, that thing about the, the density, um, where some authorities are leave, leaving on 20 miles an hour, while there is an overall score, I think that granularity that we can drill down into shows that there's something for everyone to learn here, even those of us that often feature on the, the right-hand side uh, of many of the graphs. I think it also shows how quickly we can change, uh, that the results move, that people really do take them seriously, that they are used uh, back in local authorities to encourage improvements. The chat is rich uh, with a debate on this and, and what we should do next. And, and, and is really powerful, some of the points that I'm making. Um, stepping back to basics, though, as well as space and mode, why is most of it so important is air pollution is a killer. Londoners are still suffering from it, particularly children with health conditions. Uh, and there's a huge tale of inequity here um, around areas that have very low, low levels of car ownership, but disproportionately impacted uh, by air pollution and, and congestion. I think there is obviously a huge amount as well around that roads are still too dangerous. They're too dangerous for pedestrians, they're too dangerous for cyclists, and they're too dangerous for other mode users, whether that's disabled people, students, <laughs> motorcyclists, uh, and others. And it's up to all of us to make our streets as safe as possible. Um, and that's why I've been really proud to support the Vision Zero agenda. And I do think we probably don't talk about speeding uh, enough. And that's one of the indicators that you obviously draw on. There's then that link across to climate crisis. I think you know the, the way the mayor has led the debate around the ULES expansion, around it's, it is not just air pollution. It is we will not get to net zero by 2030 if we don't tackle transport's contribution to overall emissions and that active travel provides a really important tool to what we, we can do in our boroughs uh, and, and across London. And I think the greening effect, people have been talking about green infrastructure, you know, the re climate resilience of our city is also linked to this uh, around the work to depave uh, and sustainable urban drainage. Um, I think it's all, all these agendas why London boroughs are really committed to this work. There is still obviously that discrepancy between inner and, inner and outer London uh, and I do represent all those outer London boroughs that still feel, and I think they're right to feel, that there aren't the public transport options to support uh, transition uh, and that we must continue to advocate for investment in outer London uh, around especially the bus network, but other transport uh, infrastructure. But I think it also shows that in whatever context a borough is within London, they can take action. They can take action on their own speed limits. They can work with schools around school streets. The whole parking agenda and introducing CPZs uh, is something that is a tool in every borough's uh, toolbox, whether they're in inner or outer London. And, and I hope that this encourages the continued sharing of best practice across London boroughs uh, in the spirit of collaboration as well as competition um, to, to support this uh, agenda. Clearly, just some highlights. We've obviously seen a huge movement around school streets. Two years ago, uh, school streets only covered 2% of schools in the capital. 
and they now cover 15% of schools. We obviously need to go further uh, and faster, but I think that that is a huge achievement on what has been a new tool um, that we've been using. 19 uh, boroughs have a 20 mile an hour speed limit uh, by default. Uh, I think it may have been a different figure that was quoted earlier on, but um, there's still a huge improvement. And I think the work with TfL to see more of their roads move to 20 mile an hour uh, is, is also really, really vital to this agenda and reducing the community severance that speed can cause between low traffic neighbourhoods. Uh, Waltham Forest is second only to the City of London when it comes to protected cycle tracks and Bromley has scored the highest on encouraging sustainable travel to schools uh, and Richmond has moved significantly higher um, than predicted for its population density as we saw in the figures earlier on. I'm really proud of what Hackney has achieved um, and uh, uh, I will come back to that when I finish. Just a little bit about London uh, Council's Transport Environment Committee work. We have seven climate programmes. Uh, one of them is specifically around low carbon transport that is um, led by London Borough, but really a collaboration and really looking um, on a cross party basis about how we reduce petrol and diesel journeys by 2030. Uh, and, and it sits within that wider climate programme. And um, we will continue to show that leadership on climate action. We're award winning on retrofit. I want to see us become more award winning around that class of work around low carbon transport. We also, as I said, work really crucially with uh, TfL. We've had recent meetings with Active Travel England as well, making the case to government that London needs to be funded to continue our progress. And I suppose that's where, um, as I move to a close, none of this is possible without uh, political ambition, um, the challenge that uh, Healthy Street Scorecard represents and the collective civic society um, that we have uh, on this virtual uh, meeting, but we have seen London boroughs in terms of their borough funding go from a funding settlement around uh, LIP of around £200 million a year to around £50 million uh, in, in the last TfL deal. Uh, the big choices ahead around ULES expansion, road user charging um, are absolutely vital to the capital's future, but if we don't have sustainable funding for TfL, much of what we're talking about will be so much harder to do. But I don't say it's impossible because we've seen boroughs leading even in really challenging financial circumstances. But if we're really serious around that to travel in this transition, we have to continue to see funding. And wherever you are as a Londoner, whether you're a public transport user or cyclist or car owner, the current settlement for London's transport system is unfair. Car owners are paying uh, into the system through um, the petrol, through vehicle excise duty, through other charges, uh, and none of that money is returning meaningfully to London. Uh, and we're expected to support the whole of London's transport network by tube fares and bus fares. That is simply impossible. Uh, and we must keep making that case to central government on a cross party basis. Otherwise, I think we'll see this atrophy and we won't be able to continue to make the progress that we need. Hackney is still really ambitious. Um, we will reach 100% CPZ by hopefully next uh, scorecard. Uh, we've got an ambitious programme to go beyond our 48 school streets to include more secondary schools and also looking at those primary schools that already sit within active travel measures but aren't officially school streets. Uh, we'll be uh, expanding our EV charging points to over uh, to 3,000 by the end of the decade, 1,500 in the near future to support that transition away from diesel and petrol vehicles. Um, we're about to go live with our borough-wide bike share. We're continuing to push for 20 mile an hour zones. I think there needs to be more work on speed enforcement and partnership between boroughs, police and TfL on that. And perhaps that's something we can continue to push and campaign on. And colleagues may have seen yesterday uh, the launch of the uh, Amazon uh, last mile delivery hub uh, and how we're moving to uh, active delivery rather than just EV vehicles and petrol vehicles. Uh, and the thing I'm most proudest of, and we'll be making the final announcement in the next couple of days, is ending the cycle parking waiting list in the borough in the next four years and providing all of that secure bike parking on our estates and streets uh, that much of our active travel infrastructure is created in terms uh, of demand. I hope that was a good counter through what we're doing at London Councils, what we're doing in Hackney, and why I think this event is absolutely critical uh, to this agenda. And it, um, it's an absolute honour to be here and uh, all power to our elbow to continue this work.
and lead the change that we all want to see. Thank you. Thanks so much, Phil. And it's it's just yeah, it's great. It's great to have the feedback, obviously, because a huge amount of work goes in from a lot of people. Um, there was a huge amount in there, and um, I think just to pick up on the one thing which may which is the the big money issue, and of course, um, you know, we don't want that to stop progress uh, any any more than you want it to. Um, and so I guess you know what we're constantly talking about is which of the measures pound for pound, pound for pound really deliver um really deliver something and um and i suppose things like controlled parking and um low traffic neighborhoods uh to an extent cycle track if you do it in a particular way all of these uh, input measures as we call them that we have created are are specifically designed as things which can be done uh with without huge amounts of investment and and i completely take on board what you what you've said about uh, the funding situation um, so yeah we just really really hope that things can continue uh, to improve so yeah thanks so much to all our speakers and now um, uh, I'm going to ask Emma to um, Emma Griffin from London Living Streets who's been looking at the questions in the chat to um, to come up with a few questions we we've we the, the event was scheduled to 11 30 but I think we'll try to do about 15 minutes of questions if we have that many um, and and then I'll just uh, look for some closing comments so yeah Emma Hi, yeah, thanks. I mean, there's way more than 15 here. There's loads. There's so much going here. I don't know how I'm going to choose, but I'm going to do my best. I'm going to group them into sort of sections and go from there. There's some really great comments and suggestions. So I guess I, I might just start with um, sort of questions about how the school card works, the kind of process, just to get those kind of basics out of the way. And I'll direct these to Alice or Kylie, and I'll see whoever whoever wants to. And I guess just about the bus lanes, about you know how the TA, TLRN is brought into that and whether it's just 24 hour bus lanes, maybe just a tiny bit of extra detail on that. That's come up a little, that's come up a couple of times. I'll, I'll put a couple together. Um, yeah, the school streets, primary and secondary, it's worth talking about. I know that's been an issue. Um, and yeah, another question John Chamberlain made was bus priority, uh, the proportion does a proportion of the TFL versus local roads make a difference? Maybe I'll put those three together quickly on school streets and, and the bus lanes. Um, so I'm not sure if Julio's here, but um, if if you're here, Julio, perhaps you could or, or Ollie. I know. So I'll just say so um, it does include TLRN roads. That's the Transport for London roads. Um, that's because obviously a lot of they're very important bus routes. We understand that boroughs have to work with. Um, with TfL on bus routes and uh, and on everything, um, so yeah, when we're we're looking for feedback on on the bus measure. Um, we've just done it. We we've done it in in a way that we thought was the way to do it, um, but we are interested in feedback. Uh, the detail is in the map and in in the blurb, which should be published on the website. You should be able to find it. Um, not sure if there's anything to add on that one. We could put those questions in other ways. And, and, and I guess the other one really quickly, I know this has been brought up probably before, just the naturally occurring um, low traffic neighborhoods and the ones that have been brought in. The, I know that there is an argument why that you have grouped them all together. Maybe it's worth just quickly mentioning that. Holly? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the volunteers and staff doing the, the low traffic neighborhood mapping has uh, been, there's been quite a large number of us um and so it includes all of it includes the natural what we might call a natural ltn you know there's a river going around and it's a kind of um in between that curve of the river or something so it's natural um it's designed ltn so you know some parts of thamesmead estate you know when they built the estate they said we're not going to have through traffic coming through here so it's designed like that and the retrofitted ones so it's more rather than less And again, if more questions come up, we can put those in the chat and we'll be saving the chat. And I think there's so much more. I'm not going to get through them all. And we can come back to some of these questions that have been raised um, after this after this event. So then I guess, I mean, it's just amazing to see the scorecard evolve through time. And there's so many ideas here about future potential ideas. And it's wonderful. I mean, there's absolutely, <laughs> this team, it looks a daunting list. But let's tackle a couple of these ideas because they are really interesting. So first one, I'm going to go for picking randomly. Ailey, Murray, you've talked about parklets. Obviously, this is a big issue at the moment. Can we be, can we be measuring green space um, uh, on the road network? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this one. I mean. I, I would love to have I would love to have that data 
even if it was part of the scorecard or not, I would love to have it. Creating the data is, is a massive job. So you can imagine creating that bus data has been huge. So we, as the scorecard, have to be kind of really picky about which ones we pick. That doesn't mean that we don't want other people to create data. And it doesn't mean that we wouldn't um, be interested in creating data on those issues now or in the future. But I'd be quite interested to hear from our, our speakers about what, if anything, they would put in the scorecard if they, if they could. Perhaps Sean or <coughs> Sean, Phil and Alex. Oh, Alex, go. Yeah, I mean, I just, before I hang off the call, I just get a brief thought. I mean, I think one of the challenges with that particular data set, not that I'm necessarily against the departments, I think there is that, you know, when you represent a borough like my own, you know, with, with a, probably about a third of the overall landmass taken over actually by parks that are already there, um, the pressure for green spaces is slightly different. So I think you, you, would, you would definitely get some, uh, I think, some idiosyncratic results, but that may or may not be, you know, uh, desirable. I think one of the things that is missing uh, uh, is a big task, and one of the things we, we want to set about doing something on uh, in the next year or so is about the accessibility of our street and park infrastructure to uh, all cycle users and, and those with um, impairments. I think that, you know, one of the, the issues is that quite a lot of infrastructure has been deployed in order to um, deflect criminal activity, particularly on mopeds and motorcycles. And uh, unfortunately, in this case, any infrastructure that will actually stop motorcycles and, mo uh, and mopeds will by definition also stop non-standard bicycles. So I think one of the things we want to do is kind of clear that infrastructure to make sure that it, it is genuinely accessible. So I think something around accessibility would be uh, a valuable additional inclusion. Sorry, thanks, Alex. And Phil, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I, I tend to agree with Alex about um, uh, you know active travel infrastructure that is truly accessible, whether that's parking or some of those, what I would describe usually legacy sort of changes, but sometimes actually can be temporary infrastructure. And it's really frustrating for cargo bikes, uh, families and disabled cyclists. Um, uh, so I, I agree with that. I was just thinking one way out of that parklet including parklets is thinking about canopy cover um, uh, and trees so if we're supporting walking and the use of our public realm we, we know that climate resilience is uh, often linked to canopy cover uh, it's an easy thing to measure I think well not easy but it you know it's something that we will be able to get into there's a data set with the GLA as well uh, is my understanding and if you could link that with suds and parklets and some of those other interventions I also think you know the, the walking side of it is about drop curbs it's about uh, policies around clutter like a boards it's about wayfinding um, really important basics of um, how we design our spaces to be inclusive and support uh, walking and active travel um, more broadly um, so those would be my sort of starters and also how do we further iterate that work around around the buses and embed that into the scorecard, scorecard itself because I think that really creates a movement that um, takes active travel forward. Thanks very much. And Sean? I've got a list. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, what the real basic one that relates to space is I'd love to know, and, I, and I'm trying to find this currently, um, the amount of road lane length there is and the amount of space that there is for parking, not just on the streets, I would say. It's easy to get the council to tell you about street spaces, but there's also spaces on driveways and car parks and courtyards and things. Um, those are really hard, and but I'd love to, I'd love to have them. And then, yeah, following on from, from what Phil just said, the, the other healthy streets indicators that there are um, include places to sit. Now, that I did not find in Hackney. Hackney seems to be against places to sit on the streets, quite honestly. Um, and I know there are concerns about, um, you know, potentially antisocial behaviour and people maybe using the seats. Um, but I, you know, my my answer to that is over provide them. You know, if there's one place to sit in a neighbourhood, then all the people will go and sit there. If there's loads, then they'll spread out a bit more. Um, and then the third thing is uh, public toilet coverage. Again, that really does facilitate walking and 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 doesn't trap people in their homes and that would be very easy to to add in or just explore adding in so there you go that's my list it's not all of it but it's some of them 
Thanks so much. And that's a really interesting list there. Um, sorry, sorry, Phil, did you want to come back on the, <laughs> on yeah, the benches? Just on public toilets, you know, free public toilets is something that, you know, we're really passionate about in Hackney. Um, we've been expanding and refurbishing those in our parks. So uh, I don't think there is now a park that, that um, had one of those classic kind of disused toilet blocks where we haven't brought them back into use now as free public toilets, added changing places in a few cases, accessibility access. Um, and one of my commitments at the, the last election was to ensure that all the ones in our town centres were free as well. Um, I think that goes completely against the kind of national direction of travel on toilets. And I think there's been a report by the GLA uh, on access to free toilets that Charm might have been involved in. Um, uh, reverse plug. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, it's um, a really, really important issue. The work on benches we're doing at the moment is to make sure they're inclusive so that they support um, older residents and disabled residents that need back support because a lot of the very attractive ones now in our public realm that come forward just aren't inclusive. So again, we're going to do some work with uh, our local elder, elders council to make sure that the design of those public realm features not only increases, but they're truly accepted. Thanks, and I, I think it's just kind of goes to stress how, how much we need to do and that our five impact measures are really just, are just one amongst hundreds and hundreds probably. So um, yeah, so Emma. Um, and then I'm not going to go through all the suggestions, and I think we're just going to have to log these and come back to them. I mean, Claire Lokes brings up the, the point about bus lanes unlocking um, sustainable transport, but what about other, other infrastructure like cycle hangars and cycle station hubs? Maybe that's so, and I know this, these issues have all come up in discussions with the, with the, with the school car coalition. So, and that's, we'll put that back on the list. David Housen talks about pedestrian crossings again, negative, the ones where there are still far too many junctions in London with no green man crossing where people want to walk, which is completely unacceptable now. And I know, I know there are a number of campaigns against this, including from London Living Streets and also the positive where we've got green man priority and things like that. Um, there is an also some interesting comments about kind of seeing the links. And I know this has kind of been a long-term kind of aim for the scorecard is certainly is to begin to see the link between kind of inputs and outputs. And there was um, Anthony Christoffi, I think said, um, it would be interesting to compare metrics to see if walking and cycling provision and, and KSI's change in boroughs where bus provision increases, especially on the big roads. I think I saw another comment somewhere else about this kind of, these links between the things. I don't know if anyone wants to come on that and about how the, how the school card be, can be, will go on to be seen to show kind of, yeah, links, inputs, outputs. Um, yeah, well, we, we, we're just kind of just about relieved to have got the bus data mapped in within about two weeks of having to pub publishing. So I have no idea is the answer to that, but we're definitely, we're definitely gonna be looking at the controlled parking issue. Um, and, and perhaps maybe one way forward might be to, to start to um, create links ourselves with people who can create the data and publish it for specific issues, you know, whether that's toilets or something else, because um, because you know we we trying to retain some focus, um, but at the same time, of course, we have all of these these other issues. Um, I don't know on the links between um, links between indicators. Do do, do we have? Um, uh, Sean or Phil, I think Alex has now left, unfortunately. But maybe, maybe maybe one maybe one question I can direct to Sean and Phil that's linked to this thing is I think it was a question that came right at the beginning, and I think this is the key one. Do people think that reduction in car ownership is a cause for is a cause a result of healthier streets? This is a key one, and it relates also to James Keaton's point that the worst score by density for healthy streets. Um, was Tower Hamlets and also the greatest increase in car ownership in London was Tower Hamlets. Is there, what's the cause and effect here? Any comments on that I think would be great. Shall I, shall I sorry, do Sean. <laughs> Sorry Sean, I should have yeah, that person. Sorry Sean, you go ahead. <laughs> I mean, it's clearly both. I mean, we're talking about a virtuous cycle here. So yes, that Tower Hamlets, those two things coming together in Tower Hamlets clearly um, that's a sign that those those things are linked. Um, but but then, yes, also you've got the 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 improvement that you can get when you um, improve the, the the ability to walk and cycle. Obviously, that means makes people less likely to take 
short trips. Um, one thing, one thing we also, I, don't, I think we don't, we're not talking about enough is the extent to which some of the boroughs that, that I think Camden and Hackney are both like this, boroughs where our own populations don't drive very much, but we're driven upon, we're driven through. Um, and I don't know if you're covering that particularly, but obviously then um, things that, that restrict the ability of cars to dominate our street spaces um, will help. So things that I was talking about earlier, like reducing the number of lanes on uh, places like Camden Road, Euston Road and Camden High Street, you know, these places which are the A roads that go through, that I think makes a, can make a real difference to people's longer journeys as well. And, and those, those, again, you've got a virtuous cycle there. Yeah, Phil, uh, bring you in in a one moment. So um, we, the number of times we have talked about whether traffic levels should be in our, in our scorecard or not, <laughs> we've talked about it so much. Um, and I think that the reason that we don't include it is because we know that it's it's very hard for boroughs to have a direct impact on. Uh, it's not impossible, but it is very difficult to have that through traffic. Um, so, and also we've we feel that we've reflected it in a number of other indicators, and particularly sustainable mode share. Um, but obviously, we'd be interested to hear if people feel traffic levels should be in. <laughs> um, then it's definitely been one that we've thought about a lot. Yeah, some people probably uh, with a purely happening hat on will have probably heard me talk about this before, but you know, pre pandemic, our modeling said that 40% of traffic um, was just passing through Hackney. It had no social or economic um, benefit to the borough. And you look at some of the LTNs that are less talked about perhaps in Hackney, but Hoxton West, where you have an incredibly large estate I used to represent when not barn with very low. Uh, uh, car ownership was often a cut through between um, so city road and uh, points east and, uh, and and had some of the worst air quality and was obviously outside the original ULES boundary and the congestion charge. So, you know, that is a fairly simple LTN that protects some of the largest estates in Hackney from that through traffic uh, and supports a bus route um, through there, the 394 and some of the quiet ways that have been installed. So, you know, really important interventions that you can make around some of that through traffic. We also looked at some of the data from, uh, from some of the contravention fines, the, 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 um, the fines through school streets and the LTNs. And I'm always really clear, I don't want a situation where we're finding people, it's about behavior change. And actually we're starting to see now over time a real reduction in those contraventions, which is really welcome. But the initial fines were, you know, 80% were from outside of Hackney. And even when you strip out neighbouring boroughs, uh, the figures were still incredibly high of people coming through our streets. And I think the work with Amazon um, that we've been talking about in the last 24 hours is also to look at deliveries, because I think quite rightly, some of those people that are talking about what about main roads, what about the other interventions we're going to make, we can't have a situation where people are, you know, living an active travel lifestyle but some of the parts of the system that are supporting that are still creating uh, car and van trips in a local area that can be harmful to everyone so i think that work with um, big delivery companies the circular economy work more broadly the 15 minute city work of trying to get a behavior change across the board to make sure that we aren't reducing trips in one place and increasing them in others i think is really really important and where those trips do occur they are by EV vehicle or by um, cargo bike or similar. And I think that is the, the next frontier, really. And with a purely hackney hat on, backed up by a fair and socially just road user pricing and transition package around moving away from the car. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. And, um, and I'm, I'm going to move on next to some questions. I mean, I think it's Vision Zero Week, and I think the reason Jeremy Leach isn't here from London Living Streets is because he's presenting for a Vision Zero event today. So that's why I'm stepping in. So that's, I think we'll take a couple of questions on that. I mean, Vincent makes the point that 2021 was the worst year for cycle in serious cycle injuries for a decade, and the indication is 2022 is going to be worse. Now, why might that be? Has anyone got any any... Any thoughts on that? I don't know who who wants to take tackle that first. Will I go back to Sean and or, or or maybe someone from another member from the school card would like to take that on? I don't know, Ollie. Maybe you want to or yeah. 
Uh, I'm, I don't know the details oh, on the. Who's, who's who's from? Who have we got from the LCC here? I can't remember. I know. I know Simon also is busy today. He'd be the man for this, wouldn't he? But I'm afraid. Oh. Yeah, so um, there's also the Active Travel Conference in Sheffield. <laughs> so there's some big clash going on. But um, yeah, I mean, clearly they would be saying that, you know, you need to build the infrastructure, don't you, Ollie? And um, um, and I think the interesting question for me is around the speed limit enforcements and how we're ever going to make progress with that. Because somebody, I think, posted in the chat that something like 87% of, and there's a huge proportion of people you know, going over the speed limit in 20 mile per hour. Ollie? Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't, I don't know the details on the latest data for 2022, so I don't, I haven't seen that. But um, more, you know, more broadly in terms of the results and things like this, the last couple of years have been so difficult to look into the data. We've had lockdown, going in and out of lockdowns and things like that. So when you're looking at things like serious injuries, you know, we saw we saw a, ser a big drop one year, then it's gone up somewhat again. So it, you're, you're almost looking forward just in terms of numbers um, to a period of kind of stability where you can compare what's happening today to what's happening maybe three years ago. And that because because at the moment it's very hard to make those comparisons. But I think that basically the, the message around vision is zero is that it's it's just we're just not getting there. Um, And related to that, there's a lot of questions about 20 mile per hour enforcement that's come up and quite a few people, and there's been a bit of a chat about that. And I don't know whether, um, um, Phil, would you like to go first? Thanks. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's a really unfortunate clash this morning between that the Vision Zero event and, and ours. Um, and I know that, that we're well represented though as a, a broader kind of sector and local government colleagues are at it. Um, I think the, the, the point uh, that Vincent's raised uh, and this is linked to, we've made a huge amount of progress in a very short space of time, but lots of the infrastructure stops. It, it either hits a borough boundary or it can hit a main road. Uh, it can hit a road that's not 20 mile an hour. Uh, and I think we have to look at all of those junctions uh, and where you reach the end of infrastructure, where you reach the end uh, of uh, a borough boundary and, and reflect what it's like to be a novice um, cyclist in those situations, but also where speed hasn't been tackled, where the crossings aren't in the right place, it impacts on pedestrians and other less confident road users. It's really important to remember motorcyclists uh, in this as well and the gig economy. Uh, and the pressure of that gig economy uh, around delivery drivers and, and how are they supported and protected by those, those apps. So a lot of things have been going on in a very short space of time. There are far more people um, cycling than the, the, the were before. That is not an excuse, but you know, there are more, you know, there's a 700 million pound deficit in potholes and highway repairs. That has a huge impact on safety. And that goes back to my point about London funding um, you know, that impacts on car drivers, impacts on public transport users, the emergency services and cyclists. So I do, I do think these things are, are linked together. On speed, London Council has been really clear. We believe in a decriminalisation process where the very highest offences would still go down a points-based DVLA criminal potential route supported by the police to regulate. But the police do not have the resources to regulate 20 mile an hour zones on borough roads and even on TfL roads. And there was a real log jam around camera enforcement. So the Met has invested with TfL more funding for community enforcement. There's a process you can go through to support that as communities and boroughs, but there is no ability really to introduce proper new speed enforcement with static cameras. There's a whole bureaucratic home office process. Uh, and I think between decriminalisation and improving that process, we must be able to do a better job. I, you know, static movable, so movable cameras are, are not easy to implement in terms of speeding either for a variety of regulatory reasons. So I hope we can come together to see a real change that responds to community need because it isn't about just putting static cameras on an A road and leaving that there. The, the communities often want you to do something right now around the school, 
uh, I want you to do something right now around uh, a, a rat run. And, and I think we should be in a position where we can respond as a city to that without getting caught up in uh, criminalization and, and home office regulations. That's great. Thanks for that, Phil. That's a, um, yeah, a really useful response. And I, I, I'm, I'm, we're running out of time, so I'm going to finish off with a, maybe a kind of an optimistic, maybe just a very quick line from, 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 from Phil and from, from Sean, but from anyone else that wants to give it, and it's the big question is like, how do we overcome? Who did this question come from? And I'll have to remember as I'm reading it, um, how do we over, uh, Sarah Gilroy, sorry, how do we overcome the significant pub public opposition to low traffic measures? The big question, um, how do we, and how, and uh, yeah, so any, a quick line on that. And then before I do that, don't forget to fill in, as Ollie Lord says, the ULES consultation, it's not a done deal. Fill it in and the link's in the chat. And Ollie, put it in again so we can put it there at the end. So I'll go to Sean first, thanks. <clears throat> Well, this is, I mean, this is obviously difficult. And and, and, I, and I, I, I was a little bit concerned at the beginning um, to hear Alexander sort of say, you know, we, we need to we need to be careful about annoying people because we might get voted out, you know, essentially. So I'm paraphrasing, but, um, you know, and then the people who come in might undo what we've done. Um, you know, that is a risk. But I think, you know, we've, we've got to use a combination of evidence, which is what going on here but some people aren't convinced by evidence we've got to show people how it feels when we succeed you know show people the experience is better on the streets for everybody and you know try and show people a, a vision of, of where we're going with this you know because uh, low traffic neighborhoods are not being built to annoy drivers um off the streets they are being built to create a better environment for everybody and i think the more of them we have the more of them that that succeeds, the more we show that, you know, where potentially we put in something that that needs a bit of a tweak here and there, we do get on with doing that. Um, I think, you know, we will we will succeed and show that we're doing all of this in good faith. At the moment, there's a there's a real suspicion that that this is some sort of conspiracy and it's wrong and it's not wrong. And it isn't a conspiracy, except in the sense that it's people sharing a vision and trying to achieve something good for everybody. I'd, I'd build on that. I, I, I agree. I think, though, the point I made about funding means that um, a lot of borough funding used to go into a mixture of active travel and other interventions. And I think there's a sense that you, you can't, you know, each borough will have resident pressure to do certain things. And there are huge numbers of people on this call from Hackney that have helped drive this agenda over generations forward in Hackney with elected uh, representatives and officers. And I always say, you can't be this, you know, I can be held up as a leader around it, but if you haven't got people around you that believe in it, that, that's for naught. Leadership is important, political will is important, but so is active civic society that can take the debate to the school gate about why School Street is really good for this community. You need that, if you don't have that, you can't deliver. But I also think if I was sitting in a different context in a different borough, if I can't show that I'm also listening to residents about some of the other changes that they want to make to their streets, um, which can be linked to active travel because of the funding settlement, that can make that debate really difficult. And I see from other colleagues that perhaps you would say haven't shown all the leadership that you'd want to see, that they do want to, but they also want to do some other things. And the lift process used to be able to blend those two things together and see a real local delivery. And I think that's what we're missing. We're, we're caught in a, in a, in a culture war, uh, a funding that is very short term, funding that's only directed towards certain things. It means that broad coalition around bus prioritization and cycle provision that was there in some of those lift programs all gets lost. And what I really welcome about this scorecard is it's broadened that debate, included bus prioritisation, included some of those other interventions that make a huge difference. Because actually on this, it is, we're all multimodal, most of us, and we're all a pedestrian. Some of us cyclists, the vast majority of London are bus users, and we have a really broad coalition that can make a difference if we get this right. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Thanks so much, uh, both Phil and Sean, and to Emma for um, managing the questions for us. So, so yeah, I think we're going to wrap up now. Um, and thanks to a huge number of you for staying with us for the entire event. 
Um, we've had over 100 people here, just uh, short of that now. Um, so just to say that um, really, I, th you know, I feel like we've had a year where we can finally say that, that things are changing. Um, there's a hugely long way to go, obviously, but we, um, but we are making progress and we need to make more progress. So, so yeah, we, we look forward to working with you, all, all of you, um, to continuing to make, to make things happen. And um, yeah, so I think that's about it from us for now so uh goodbye from us and we'll see you next year any questions of course you can come to us anytime please do thanks bye